Happy Thursday, everybody, and welcome to a brand new episode of The Hot Mic. Here, brought to you by Above the Line, the fun folks over there at AboveTheLine.com, writing incredible articles, breakdowns, and analysis for everything that's going on in the world of entertainment. I am the outlaw, John Roca, joined as always by the insider himself, Jeff Snyder. How are you, Jeff? Wonderful, Johnny. How was your Thanksgiving? It was good, but it was solo, man. I was by myself. I went to Boston Market, stood in line in a terrible line, and... Got some food for way overpriced, went back home, watched some football, and enjoyed it. My lady was up north, so I couldn't hang out with her. But, you know, it's just a day, but it was nice to have a day off to just sit and watch football all day, actually. That, that, that does sound nice. Why do they call it Boston Market when in Boston it's called the Boston Market? <laughs> I guess that uh, R and that H transfer. I, I froze my ass off in Boston. It was great to see the family and everything. I took my niece to her very first movie. We did not yeah. make it quite uh, all the way through Strange World. We gave her, we basically let her eat as much sugar as she wanted. <laughs> and then about 75 minutes into the movie, she just crashed. So, wow. <laughs> wait, yeah. the movie was still going on past 75 minutes? <laughs> well, the, but you got it. Okay. First, like, why do they have 20 minutes of trailers on these kids' movies? Like, I can barely get these, this kid to like focus on something for five minutes, you know? <laughs> Well, apparently she wasn't the only one that left the theater early, judging from the box office for Strange World, sadly. So uh, one that looks like it's going to lose about $100 million is what they're saying overall, or maybe more, Jeff. It depends on what the final numbers are. But uh, the How box office was not Jake good. Jake Gyllenhaal for this movie. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they surprised him that he actually forgot that his dad was uh, Dennis Quaid in one of those interviews there, which I thought was really funny from, uh, from uh, what was the name of that film? Frequency? Is that what it was, Frequency? It was Day After Tomorrow. Oh, Day After Tomorrow. That's it. Day After Tomorrow. That's right. Sorry, I'm thinking someone else. But yeah, so very interesting stuff to go with Strange World. But anyway, we're not going to talk about We're talking about a whole mess of new stuff going on in the world of entertainment. And today, Jeff, there was like trailers on top of trailers on top of trailers. Not sure if you got a chance to see any of these things, but we're going to lead off talking about that, I think. And before we do, just want to remind you to please send in your stream labs and super chats as we go along. You love the show. You enjoy the show. We come at you with a unique point of view about everything that's going on in the world of entertainment. So send in your support now through stream labs and super chats. Come on. It's Christmas. Send in your love. All right, Jeff. Okay. Uh, we, we got, got, we got, got three. Transformers Rise of the Beast, Indiana Jones 5, and we got uh, oh, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, and we got Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Did you watch any of these trailers? And if you did, what are your thoughts on all these trailers? Uh, I did watch them all. I mean, okay. Indiana Jones, like, again, I'm just not an Indiana Jones guy. If I see this movie, it'll be solely because of James Mangold and the respect I have for James Mangold. I do like Boyd Holbrook. It was cool to see him in the trailer, but, like, yeah. it, otherwise it did nothing for me. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. What's driving me nuts is wasn't Volume 2 V-O-L period 2? <laughs> yes. Wasn't it? Yes, and and this is via it spells out the word volume. It's driving me insane. Okay, a little okay. consistency would be nice, but never mind that. Uh, it looks good. I actually enjoyed the Guardians holiday special. Did you watch that, John? Yeah, it was great. We just reviewed it earlier this morning on the Geek Buddies. Yeah, a lot of fun that sh uh, that uh, special. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it as well. Um, although you know, like a quarter of it was just like singing and dancing, and God forbid. <laughs> I get it. It's a holiday special. Oh, I'm the Grinch. Blah, blah, blah. Did you uh, also not like Spirited? I bet you liked Spirited. Come on. Spirited, I turned off after 50 minutes. Oh, my God. Dude, my dad and, and I watched with my dad and his girlfriend, and we were all like, oh, my God, this is insufferable. <laughs> <laughs> we gave it almost an hour. I was just like, all are right, you sticking with this, guys? Because there's another 70 minutes left in this movie. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay. Um, um, well, what did you think of the? Okay, 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 okay. What, what, wait, what was the other one? I forget. Uh, oh, Transformers. oh, the Transformers. Transformers. I mean, looked okay, but it, you know, it just looks like an Avengers movie, basically with robots, right? <sighs> oh, Jeff. I, I, you know, listen. The first Transformers trailer looked fantastic. It was a nice mixture of the Michael Bay approach to things with the more grounded approach to things that we got from uh, from Bumblebee. So I liked that, Anthony Ramos. We didn't get too much of the story here. Like, what is 
his connection they they've released that he's his uh, he's connected to the military and his brothers in electronics but what is the overall story we didn't get too much of that but getting to see the scope of this thing i thought was really cool and having ron perlman come in as the voice of optimal prime to go toe-to-toe with peter cullen as optimus prime i thought was really cool so the maximals were were fun to see and we'll see what more of that we get we get some rc action which is like g1 transformer so that's cool as well. So there's a lot that's uh, going on here that I thought was really good. A lot going on. It's you know what? It's it's like Alejandro Gonzalez Inarritu's Bardo in that oh. sense. There's, there's a lot going on in both of these movies in very different ways. Let me tell you. That's for sure. And I loved Bardo. So there you go. That you put that on the table. Um, our Indiana Jones one looked a lot of fun. Once again, scope of this was pretty cool. Getting to see. I mean, the de aging even worked in that one sequence. I thought was fun. We don't get too much with bad, uh, Mads or with uh, Boyd, so we don't know what their overall goal is. Uh, and we only get a shot of uh, Antonio Banderas, like real quick shot of Antonio Banderas. Who already came out. Banderas? Okay, I was yeah. like, isn't that Antonio Banderas? Um, he, he already came back and said he had a very small part, but they asked him to do it, and he was absolutely down to be a part of an Indiana Jones film. So, What do you think uh, of the title? Uh, I don't like the title, to be honest with you. It's not – if this is his last go-around, the Dial of Destiny uh, feels like a mid – um, uh, mid installment in a whole big series. It's like, oh, we got to get to this next one, but let's do this one. It's called the Dial of Destiny. Let's move on to the next one. This one feels like, okay, um, why are we ending with this kind of title? I, I even think Kingdom of the Crystal Skull has more um, going on for it as a title than the Dial of Destiny. What about you? Other than the alliteration, it doesn't do much for me. <laughs> I, am a, I am a general fan of alliteration, but yeah, yeah. Um, and then the Guardians one I thought was really good. Um, we saw a longer one at Comic Con, but with completely different footage. That one focused more on Rocket uh, Rocket story and with the High Evolutionary and all of that. But clearly, there's going to be a lot of emotions here, Jeff. I mean, you're seeing Peter Quill reacting, screaming at someone who is dying on the table. As you said, with the holiday special, could that be Mantis? Could that be his sister? His last connection to his ma- to his dad, his actual father, all of that, like. Is there something going on, or is that Gamora? Is that Rockets? There's a lot of questions here that I thought were really cool, but the good humor, good song, uh, and the visuals were absolutely sumptuous. I it think. was a great song. I love that they went. Do you know who that was? I know the song, but I don't remember who the artist is. Space Hog, baby. Oh, that's there you go. Space. Right Hog. in the meantime. Ooh, wee, ooh, ooh. Yes, it also it opened David Spade's first comedy special. <laughs> Oh, nice. Nice. All right. Um, all right. Well, those are, those are our thoughts on these trailers. Let us know what you thought as we go along here in the comment section below as well. Remember to hit a like uh, and send in your stream labs and super chats as we go along. All right, Jeff, where would you like to go next? You had a lot of suggestions when I tossed out uh, some subjects. So is there one you want to jump into next? I mean, no, I want, I want your take on emancipation, Johnny. That's okay. Who, are you allowed to give your take on it? Uh, yes. We're allowed to review last night at 10 PM. Last night was the uh, review embargo. Uh, so um, I see you tomorrow morning. You so oh, good. Yeah, there was a lot of reviews that came out today. Some of them were not that uh, complimentary to it. Call it would. I don't know what movie they were watching. I was absolutely engrossed from the beginning to the end. Really enjoyed Will Smith. It's an absolute fever dream of a movie. Do not go in thinking you're going to get some kind of linear thing. It is very much a fever dream. It's a new way to tell this freedom narrative a story about a slave, this famous slave and the picture that was taken of him that became the face of slavery all over the world. Uh, And it's an interesting approach from Fuqua. And there's no time like, let's get to know these characters. No, you're thrust right into it. And I kind of like that. And I think Will Smith, in my opinion, delivers the greatest performance of his career. Uh, I think it's better than King, uh, his what he did in King Richard, better than we did in Pursuit of Happiness. There is so much going on when he's speaking and not speaking. I think that's the really important thing, not speaking, that kind of moves me and just you see the dedication that he has. And this is told in a really interesting way in terms of the visuals, right? That kind of it's kind of pseudo black and white, but not fully black and white. Uh, and Ben and, Fo- and Ben Foster is uh, chilling yet again. I mean, it's something he knows to do well as a villain uh, and the pursuit and the, the chase is very thrilling. It's reminded me of the fugitive in a lot of ways, the um, Andrew Davis film with Harrison Ford. Um, and then there's like some great twists, some interesting twists and turns rather, and some scary shit that goes on as well. And Fuqua pulls no punches with depicting slavery. You know, other people, they, other filmmakers, they'll show a little bit. He goes all the way 
And it's brutal and ugly and harrowing. And I think there are certain moments where he's trying to subtly make a commentary about what's going on in our world uh, for our uh, for black men and women in our world um, with how they're being treated in our world. So if you if you catch it, you catch it. Hmm. That's my two cents. Uh, well, I am. I've listen. I, I've heard really good things about this movie for a while now. OK. Uh, and that's why I, I had a feeling that Apple was going to release it this year, because if it's a good movie, you don't stick them you don't stick that on the shelf okay right uh, you know what i but like from day one it was always pitched as like an action thriller it is an action thriller right and, yeah. and i think that some people were not expecting that maybe like just in reading yeah. between the lines of the reviews they're like this is you know fuqua can't sort of resist some of those impulses or instincts to go to take it in that direction, maybe. Right. Um, but like that is, yeah, that's always how it was envisioned, especially in order to like justify its budget, you know, right. like it was a, an expensive movie for, for Apple. Um, you know, I'm seeing like stuff about like the white screenwriter, right. Or, yeah. uh, uh, or you know, not, not black. I, I, you know, I don't even know if, if Bill College is white or whatever. I, mean, I assume mm -hmm. he is, but he's not black. Um, so like, I know that that's like played an issue, yeah. Or part in some of these. Did you see the, the interview that Joey McFarland yeah. gave? Oh. Uh, no, I thought you were going to say about the Trevor Noah interview. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we can talk about that too in a second because I do want to get your thoughts on the slap and Will Smith and, and all the yeah. Oscar stuff. But like yeah. Joey McFarland is the producer on this, and Joey McFarland was like wrapped up in all like the Wolf of Wall Street movie mm. lawsuits and all that stuff. Yeah. Like, there's always some unsavoriness going on in, in the financing with, with a them. producer. No. Yeah, all right. Anyways, Joey McFarland whips out like the original uh, uh, whipped Peter like mm -hmm. photo on the carpet, and he's like showing it off like it's like part of like his prized baseball card collection. Yeah. Okay, and it's like a piece of Black history, and he's like, you know, this is part of my collection, and I, when I die, like I will donate it to education. And I'm just like, <laughs> like I don't know, man. Listen to yourself. Yeah. Uh, I thought I thought it was super cringe, um, yeah. and and I don't know, man. Like, I, I'm just very curious how this movie will be packaged in terms of awards and everything. It seems like some like the response has been really positive, but I have also seen some people just be like, cut it off at the knees. Like, absolutely not. Yeah. This movie ridiculous. Yeah, David wrapped all over it, which I was surprised by. Yeah, right. The, the Daily Beast reviewer tore to pieces. The IndieWire. Reviewer didn't give it too much love, um, th but there have been some positive reviews on it. I mean, listen, you're going to get mad at me and some people might get mad at me, but the way I look at it is I'm looking for black reviewers. I'm going to read black reviewers first and see their takes on this, what their approaches to it, what what I might have missed as someone who has not had this experience relayed to me uh, through multiple generations. So those kinds of things, those are what I'm looking for. I'm looking to see the more in-depth analysis. I will turn to those reviews more for this right. particular film and then swing back to the other, of course, more notable reviewers who've been reviewing films for years, no matter what the color scheme is there. So that's the kind of approach I have with this um, to see where I'm at with it. But I don't know how you don't package this as a best picture Best director, best actor. I would throw best score in there. I'd put that in my best cinematography. I put that in my tweet. Like though, th these are the things that I think it should be up for, and I do think it should be up for best actor. I do think it. Yeah. So you th so, okay? So you think that he gave a a, a nomination worthy performance? Do you think he deserves to win? Was he better than Brendan Fraser? I don't know. I haven't seen the whale. I'm seeing that tonight, actually. So I don't know how to. I don't know yet how I feel about that overall. Some people. Someone asked me about uh, Colin Farrell. How would it compare it to Banshees of Inisherin? And Although I liked what Colin did in Banshee of Sharon, what Will is doing is something completely different, man. So it's it's one of those kind of Oscar level performances for sure. Yeah. Um. Do, so I mean, as if you were a voter, yeah. would you hold the slap against him, or would you be able to separate the art from the artist? I'm so past that slap. It's I don't get it. Like I'm just so not. I don't give a fuck about it anymore. Like honestly, I think it's something people are holding on to and creating a massive drama around that I'm really done by. Like. I get it. Like when I first reacted to it at the Oscars all those months ago, I was incorrect and in, in trying to blow it off. It was my natural reaction. I didn't think it was a big deal. But then, of course, when I took a step back, saw the scope of it, I understood the context. It's not a good thing. And even uh, other uh, black people have come out and spoken about it. Black pundits, black, black people in the uh, in, in the uh, um, uh, oh gosh, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but but black people were involved in the community here who are activists and what they spoke about how this was kind of a black Oscars, a black executive producer, and he embarrassed us. And I think I think that carries weight. 
So, but it's been months and he's apologized seven ways to Sunday. He went on that 20 minute interview with Trevor Noah and apologized and spoke about the journey he's been on, the mistakes he made, how he kind of be, dialed into some toxic masculinity there and he has lessons to learn. But he looks good. He looks happy. He looks like he's moved on. And we all need to fucking move on. It was a slap. Grow the fuck up. People do worse to each other. You've given awards to producers who've done way worse to people, for God's sakes. And look, and none of you fuckers went to see She Said. So you're going to step out here and try to go after Will? But you fuckers didn't go see She Said, which basically chronicles someone who is physically abusing and raping people in your own community. And you're not going to, and you're going to come after Will for a slap. I just think there's like a, a disconnect here, man. I'm just trying to picture like if my friends or someone that I knew in town, like got into a bar fight or something like for the rest of their lives, you wouldn't like whisper as they walked by, like, Oh, that's the guy who got into the bar fight. Like, yeah. yeah. who cares? Yeah. Who cares? Yeah. Uh, I think the whole thing was totally blown out of proportion. Obviously it was yeah. totally out of character for Will Smith. And, you know, it was a media, it was a reporter's dream. Right. right, it was a reporter's right. fucking dream that slap. But in the end, I, I don't think we need to hold it against him his entire career, and that includes just one year. Ron Artest went into the stands and beat people up, and he was on a team next year. He won a fucking championship with the Lakers. We all love Meta World Peace. Right? That's what I'm saying. Like it, people make these mistakes in these heated moments. It wasn't like he just just keyed on Chris Rock for no reason and pummeled him. That's a whole other conversation. That's something that's dangerous. What happened was he said what he said. The wife got offended. He stood up, took care of business, and that's it. It was the wrong thing to do. But for people to keep holding on to it, like he mauled Chris Rock in the back of an alley, it just it's kind of crazy to me that people are still holding on to that, for God's sakes. You know, uh, Adrian Brody, like, forced Halle Berry to kiss him. I watch that kind of stuff. Jim Carrey, when you watch that picture, the video of him forcing a kiss on the woman, that's as bad as slapping a man and y'all forgave and went back to their movies and enjoy the shit out of what they were doing. So to me, it's just like, I, I feel like there's a hypocrisy going on here. And I do think because he's black, it's a whole different situation. But you know, not LeBron the kind of hypocrisy that LeBron James is alluding to, right? I like, was just going to say. <laughs> dude, what is this guy fucking talking about? No one's asking you about Jerry Jones because you don't play football. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. Mr. Yasman 300. Yeah, Louis C.K. did more inappropriate stuff than Will, and he won a Grammy. Exactly. Yeah. If you bought Will C Louis C.K.'s album, but you're crying about Will Smith, you take a look at the hypocrisy. Take a look well, at the listen, hypocrisy. People equate the Grammys with the Oscars, and the truth is it couldn't be further like from that. Like To me, I don't give a shit who wins a Grammy. It doesn't make them some incredible artist the way that winning an Oscar, to me, makes right. an artist. Okay? Right. A zillion people get fucking Grammys for garbage music I'll never listen to. If, if if Ezra Miller delivers a, an incredible life-changing performance in Flashpoint, are the same people who have issues thinking of Will for an Oscar going to come out and say, no way should Ezra Miller be nominated, blah, blah, blah. It, it, then you're consistent. Then you're consistent in that situation. I don't think it is, you know? Anyway. All right. Okay. But I thought the interview was great. If you guys have seen the interview with Trevor Noah, it's, it's a fantastic interview with Will. I, I am so past it all. I just think people holding on to it for their own reasons and they need to explore why they're holding on to it. Like you really need to explore why you're holding on to it. If it triggered trauma in you, then go and figure that out. Go and get therapy, go and figure that out because Will is not responsible for your trauma. Will had a moment, he lost control and he, he has apologized a million times. And if you don't want to give weight to the apology like you give to the slap, then who's the problem here? So, Ooh, right. John Roca with food for thought. I'm just saying. All right, let's move on to what Wait, do you want to do? I want I want more thoughts from John Roca. How was Violent Night? Violent Night was a blast, an absolute blast. I was so afraid this film was going to disappoint me, I go but I went to see it a full theater, and people were laughing, enjoying, clapping after sequences. Like it was such a great experience to be in that theater, enjoying the movie as much as other people were enjoying it. I don't mean critics; it was a, a mixture of. Uh, of the press and, uh, and and regular people watching the show, or watching the movie rather, and reacting to it. Harbor is great. The little girl is fantastic. Their chemistry is the selling point. And the, the action sequences are actually really well done. And the way they each discover who he actually is as the film goes along works organically in the narrative that they're telling. It's not forced. And what it all leads to is great. And so I, I was really surprised how much I enjoyed this movie 
And after seeing that cocaine bear trailer, I'm like, they may have found something here. These kind of darker black comedy horror or grotesque or bloody type action films. Okay. That they I can want to talk about both of those things. So yeah. first of all, what did you think of the cocaine bear trailer? That's a good trailer. That was a lot of fun. That trailer. I, I, I'm no big fan of Elizabeth Banks as a director, but this looks like she understood the assignment really, really well. I mean, the shot of the bear in slow motion diving towards the ambulance. That's genius. Plus, you've got a really good cast. Alden Ehrenreich, Kerry Russell, all these people involved in it. The well, great, I, great Ray Liotta. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, it's kind of like very blatantly like, yeah, we're, we're proud to be the next snakes on a plane or whatever it is. I just thought it was a little too comedic. Like I, I was expecting it to be a little bit like more serious and like action thrillery than like comedy. Violet Maybe. Knight? No, Cocaine Bear. Oh, Cocaine Bear. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah the trailer. Well, like, we did see I, I that. I love the idea. I was super excited for, for this, but like the trailer almost like, I don't know. It, I, it almost showed too much of the bear. Like, I don't know what I was expecting. Like a Jaws type thing where like they hide the bear a little bit more. I don't know. <laughs> well, you've got to sell it. It's in the title, Cocaine Bear. You've got to show the Cocaine Bear. Um, but you do see, see him dragging. The bear looked real fake. Yeah, well, you know, you're not making this for a high budget, you know. <laughs> Carrie Russell well, is Nor should they, nor should they. Right, right. Um, but this is a Universal okay. Pictures film, Jeff. This isn't some independent arm of Universal. This is a straight up Universal Pictures release. Right. So, and, and they're putting it in wide commercial release. Exactly. So, mm -hmm. here's my question to you. Like, and I think it was like ERC box office that sort of alluded to this. Like, would we have rather have had the dark universe? Right. Or are we content yeah. with this weird universe of like weird horror movies that Universal is sort of putting out, whether it's Renfield coming up or Knock at the Cabin or, <sighs> or Megan and, and, you know, just like some of that. Like it was just a good point to me, like that Universal consciously chose a different path. Violent Night is one of them as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, that's what I think. I think they understand that there's this little niche they can carve out for themselves within the horror movie and action movie crowd if they find a way to tell these kind of interesting stories or funny stories or fun stories with a bit of a dark comedic bent, but right. not scrimp on the gore, which certainly Violet Knight doesn't or scrimp on the horror, which could be in cocaine bear, which they didn't show. Um, I mean, you're seeing Margot Martindale basically become DiCaprio and Revenant. So are we going to see situations? Cause you see them getting dragged into the woods and the thing where he's climbing the tree for the other dude after the kid, he doesn't go after the kid. That's some scary ass shit. So to me, there's going to be some You're horror right. movie horror scenes here combined with some funny scenes as well. Yeah. I mean, cocaine bear sells itself. And by the way, like that Twitter account, I'm, I'm looking forward to high comedy from that account over the next few months. Like I just loved it. It's bio, right? I'm the bear. Yeah. Who cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't know. Like I just, uh, I think I think Universal has stumbled on something where it's like they don't need this big IP. Yeah, Killer Doll, like that that sells it for me for Megan. Uh, right. You know, Santa Claus killing bad guys, like that's all you need. Things that fit in almost three words, you can describe it in that. You know. Yeah, and that's where I think you and I disagree on Tarantino's comments about Captain America. I, I think Chris Evans is the star, uh, but the this the thing is this. Think like, Chris Evans is a movie star? Yeah, I do. But I think I think what you're talking about here on this side of the fence with these movies, you don't need stars to be in this movies. You just need so, maybe people that you recognize, but the premise or the title is what's going to hook people and a good trailer. That's what's going to hook people to come in right. uh, and have some fun with it. Because I think people have a dark, com darkly, dark comedic sensibility anyway because life is so fucked up So pe for most people. So you have to find a way to laugh through the madness of it all. And I think that's what these movies appeal to. They're fantastical in their premises, but they're in the execution. There's something to really enjoy um, and get something. And I'm telling you right now, I shed a tear in Violent Night. Uh, at near the end. Violent Night. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, you'll see, Jeff. You'll if see. I, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I, will, I will text you as soon as that happens. Um, all right. Here's another John uh, Roca specialty right oh here. God. All right. The Bruce Lee movie. Right. Yeah. This is Universal is doing this, right? Yeah. Yeah. Is, is wow. it Universal? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Universal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what do you think about that? Ang Lee directing a Bruce Lee movie starring Bruce Lee's son, who no one's really heard of. 
Right, right. Um, I, I haven't we had a number of Bruce Lee films recently already? So I wonder. I mean, this is going to come with some pedigree because Ang Lee, right, who's got a legendary track record of creating some fantastic films that both appeal to the um, uh, cinephiles and appeal to people who enjoy a little more of the action stuff as well. But it's Ang Lee's son, not Bruce Lee's son. It's Ang Lee's son, Mason Lee, who's attached to star in the film. And it's developed. Wait, it's really? developed I it's totally still- misread that whole item. Yeah. Wait, it's yeah. not. Okay. So, cause I was like, wait, Bruce Lee has a son that. No, no, there's only, there was only Brandon. There was only, it, it would be a grandson if anything. Right. But, and yeah. that's what I was thinking. I was yeah, like, yeah, wait, yeah. what? Okay, so forgive me. I misread that entire item. Right. Okay, so it's Ang Lee is directing his own son. His own son. Yeah. Yeah, about Bruce Lee. And and um, it, the script is being written by Dan Futterman, who did Capote and Foxcatcher. So clearly, they're approaching this with a bit more depth than we've seen before. You know, and I, and I, I thought the Dragon film by Rob Cohen was a good film for its time. You're but telling you're gonna... me that Ang Lee, like this guy conducted, if he had conducted a worldwide search for global talent to play fucking Bruce Lee, that he's living with the, the guy? I don't know. I don't know. I, mean, I don't buy that. I, I don't think I like that. Yeah. I guess if you're Ang Lee, you have the, the power to, to push that through the system. But yeah, I don't know. Well, it's going to be for Sony, right? Sony. So, um, but okay. it's interesting, Not but universe. I think it's the right approach, to be honest with you. I think you keep it in-house. Let's see what you can create. Nepotism, certainly there'll be complaints about nepotism in Hollywood, but it happens, and it doesn't mean that they can't act. I mean, Paltrow can act. A number of child star, child, uh, child of actors or child of creators can act. Uh, we're seeing Bryce Dallas Howard essentially becoming a new great director for the Howard name there, so... That can happen. Uh, so I give a little bit of space for Ang Lee because he's delivered so many incredible films that I, uh, if you forget Gemini, man, uh, that I think you, he, he's earned a little bit of credit to try this out with his son. He has, yeah. which is why I think you give him a Bruce Lee biopic. I got, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm comfortable with that, but I did not realize that Ang Lee had cast his own son. I totally misread that item. Yeah. Uh, my apologies. And um, I don't like it. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, do we have any like? Does he have any experience, Mason Lee? Is he does a... have some experience acting okay. and in stuff that wasn't, you know, Ang Lee's or whatever. But well, was he a lead? This is going to be interesting. I don't think so. And his daughter is going to Bruce Lee's daughter is going to serve as a producer here, Shannon Lee. So she'll be part of it. Um, so very interesting, though. I mean, it's yeah, just but, interesting that Sony would go back to Ang Lee because it is Sony, not Universal. That Sony yeah. would go back to him after a fucking Billy Lynn, which was a flop. That was terrible, that film. That was a rough watch for sure. Oh, Mason Lee was in Hangover Part 2? Yeah, I don't even remember that film at all. So, um, uh, <laughs> Are you worried that he might shoot the film in that 60 FPS like he did Gemini Man? Oh, I, I hope he doesn't. I it might look like it because Bruce Lee was the fastest man on Earth. That's true. Um, let's hit some of these Streamlabs, Jeff, that have come co- through here before we take a break. Sketchcraft says, love the show, guys, and appreciate all of Jeff's scoops as of late. A uh, quick question. Rob Liefeld recently tweeted that Marvel Studios lost their fight choreographers post Endgame and fights in Phase 4 minus Shang-Chi have been subpar. Your thoughts on this, Jeff? I mean, you know, I don't really think of Marvel fights as like the most, like the, the classic movie fights. If you were to tell, you know, say, Jeff, here's the assignment, do the top 10 movie fights of all Ooh. time. I'd be very surprised if there was a Marvel fight on there. So maybe, maybe the fight between Bucky and cap and Iron Man, that might be the closest thing uh, that I would have to the hand to hand combat. That was fun to watch. No, uh, that, in the Marvel that, movie. The list, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Sketchcrafts also says, uh, just wanted to toss, just wanted to see what you both thought about the super Mario trailer. I personally loved it. Looks amazing and tons of fun. Also, do you think the avatar trailers have been too reserved in showing what the film is about, lack of action or story so far, Jeff? I mean, we I see Avatar next week. Uh, I think it's a movie about character. I think it might yeah. be a tough, a, a tricky movie to sell. Yeah, if it's not like it may not be like a real plot driven movie. Um, I think this yeah. is something where we're really going to explore the characters more. Uh, the first one was about you know introducing those ca- characters, establishing, set, setting up the world. But now we get to go deeper. So I, I actually think that this movie is going to be more emotional. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think the trailers have done a fine job. I, I think it's going to open strong and have really good legs. Yeah, the 175. I mean, is that low? Do you agree with the projection? The projection? No, I think that that is the new 250. Okay. Right. Don't you think? like That's the post-COVID 250 is what right. you're saying? Exactly. If that's what Black Panther's opening to around 175, yeah. whatever it was. Yeah. I think that's sort of that's where the big movies are going to open now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I like the Mario trailer. I thought it was a lot of fun as well. Um, we'll, but I'm not a, you know, I'm not a hump Mario's leg kind of guy. I'm not like all addicted to Mario. So for me on the outside, I was before Mario guys, so he didn't <laughs> grow up playing. Mario. Yeah. As uh, Michael said earlier, he's playing pong when you guys were I was gonna say, John is really just ready for the, the, the wooden paddle with a ball on a string movie. <laughs> Give me the steel tire. I hit with a stick down the street. John grew up playing these things called jacks. <laughs> <laughs> when I was your age. He shot marbles. <laughs> I'll show you what our cell phone was. It was a steel can with a string attached to it. Anyway, Adam Jimenez says, hey, guys, just a little rant. I'm so tired of reviewers and pundits not saying that they don't like a movie or a movie is crap. Making these political statements to just keep themselves in good graces with studios is so fake. I hate it. That's why I listen to the hot mic. You guys uh, you guys tell the truth if something is crap. You're going to say it is crap, and that's why I come back week after week. End of my rant. Sorry, guys. Keep it real. Jeff? Guys, that's, that's why John's invited to more things in San Diego than I'm invited to in Los Angeles. <laughs> they don't invite me anywhere anymore because I, I just speak my mind freely, and I just yeah. say, yeah, Ryan Johnson, you, it's, this movie isn't very good again. Uh, I know you were, you liked Glass Onion more. Than I did I. like Glass Onion. Yeah, I thought it was better than the first film too. But <laughs> it was picture talk, I I just don't understand it. Yeah. Um, what was the question? <laughs> he was just saying that he enjoys the fact that we tell the truth or tell our truth, so we say. And we I don't, don't know how to do it. anything else. Yeah. And Super Mario Brothers is going to be fucking huge next year. Yeah, yeah. Who doesn't want to see that movie? I know it does look good. It does look good. Even the people who are complaining about it. Great, no, it doesn't look great. I saw the tweet. Galley Production says, "Broad no commentary on the Mario trailer. We just talked about it. Um, I, I didn't get to a chance to talk about please, it. Please, go ahead. Please. I, I mean, I, I think it looks good, but there's something missing. I don't know. Really? But I, I, like, I love seeing Rainbow Road. That was so cool for me. Yeah. Uh, some of the gags. Like, it, it just it looks funny. It looks clever. Yeah. Uh, I think Illumination was the right company to take that on. I think if they they just like I'm trying to imagine what like Pixar's version of the Super Mario Brothers would be, and I and I think it's in the right hands with Illumination. Yeah, uh, my only concern. It's funny. A lot of people were bitching about Chris Pratt's voice. I think Chris Pratt did a fine job. It's he's he's doing a very subtle on the edge Italian accent. He's not going to be oh he's not going to be fucking Jared Leto from Gucci. He's doing something completely different. Let him play with it. I don't understand why people are so upset about this. Because Somebody was like, he's a plumber from New York. Sonic having teeth or whatever the hell. Yeah. Like, I just, who, who gets upset over these designs and voices? Come on. Yeah, it's mind-blowing. Hannah R. says, do you think the rumors about KK leaving LF are false? Yeah, uh, Kathleen Kennedy leaving Lucasfilm. There's always those rumors. Every every few months, those every few days, maybe those rumors pop up, man. Do you hear yeah, anything on this? It's been around forever. Uh, I know because I've been looking into them forever. Uh, no, I don't think that she is going anywhere. I think that she'll definitely be there through the end of Iger's run. So yes. She'll be there for two years at least. Yeah. I think um, if anything, Iger coming back solidifies her position even more. Yes. Absolutely. He, he put her there, right? I mean, yep, exactly. I, I think that, yeah, Kathy is definitely safe for the next two years. I would imagine that she, I don't know if, she'll, if she leaves with Iger, provided Iger actually leaves. Right. Yeah. Right. Just right. Right. Ninety-two year deal doesn't mean he's leaving after two years necessarily. Right. Right. But um, I, I could either see her leaving with Iger, and short of that, maybe just getting the next movie off the ground. Yeah. There you go. Uh, Hannah also says, uh, "Do you know if Nintendo has any plans to adapt Zelda?" Going too quickly. Yeah. Too quickly. Going too quickly. We're moving too quickly on on these on these things. We, oh, I, so. we were still going on on these Star Wars things. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Keep going. You know, your son. So I mean, what do you like? What do you think is going to be next? What do you mean next on what? The next Star Wars movie. Next Star Wars movie, I think is definitely going to be. Um... I'm saying if I'm saying Kathy's going to go either with Iger or after she launches the next Star Wars movie, mm -hmm. the question becomes: What is the next Star Wars movie? 
I think it's Lindelof's film. I don't think it's going to be YTD's film. I think that's dead in the water, to be honest with you. I, I don't think it's going to be Ryan Johnson, also dead in the water. Um, Feige has talked about producing a film, but with all the phase four uh, kind of uh, mixed reactions, I think he's even more dedicated to focusing on Marvel, kind of like Patty Jenkins shoving Rogue, Rogue Squadron aside so she could redeem herself and the franchise with Wonder Woman 3. She wants to focus on that. I think Feige wants to focus even more on Marvel now. So to me, Lindelof coming in um, will absolutely uh, create something. And I think with Andor opening the door to a grittier, introspective, political Star Wars kind of excites Lindelof considering what he did with Watchmen. So I think that is what we might be seeing as our next Star Wars movie, a mirror, a kind of combo of the darkness of greatest and or and the original trilogy type stuff that's a little more in the um you know woo star wars you know so i, I think there's going to be a mixture of that and that may be the next film and i think lindelof is going to do that yeah yeah i mean i think and again this is me saying i think yeah um that that lindelof's movie will be the next one as well mm -hmm. i do think that kevin is very much focused on the future of marvel right okay. Uh, I don't know, like Michael Waldron, who was supposed to be writing his Star Wars movie, like, right, he's writing Secret Wars now, too, right? Right, right, right. Yep. You can only, I mean, really write one at a time. And I'm pretty sure Secret Wars is the priority there. Yeah. So yeah. make of that what you will. Um, I think that, like, so with Lindelof's movie. Yeah. There's been these, like, you know, it's always the one sentence in these stories, right? Mm -hmm. and I think that, you know, there was a sentence in THR's story or whatever, but it was like people from the original trilogy could, or not the original trilogy, but the sequel trilogy could come back, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I Again, who is who could that be? Well, Adam Driver's real busy these days. Oscar Isaac's pretty busy. Yeah. Uh, John Boyega wants no part of it. And, you know, who would probably... Who, whose career would probably really benefit from a Star Wars movie right now. I think we're talking about Daisy Ridley. Yeah. yeah. I, I think Daisy Ridley will end up returning for, for Dame Lindelof's movie. Um, and that all like these, you know, this next run of Star Wars movies will probably be set in that sequel trilogy timeline. Yeah. 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 I agree. I think Ridley is the one to come back first, but I do think Boyega will come back. It just will depend on the script. Uh, it really depends on the script. And I think Oscar Isaac will be very curious to see what happens because Moon Knight wasn't that well received. So this is the second thing that he's done under the Disney banner in a franchise situation where it wasn't 100% well received by the fan base that he was doing it for. So is that going to affect him coming back into a Star Wars? Does he want to prove him even more that it can work? So it all depends on what they pitch him. And I think the script and the story is going to be essential Especially for Boyega, who was when he was doing the tour for Woman King, made that very clear on, on Sirius XM when he was talking to Fugel saying, I think he was just saying, like, hey, this is this is the approach I want to take or the approach I want to go with. And if they want me back, this is what I would probably demand if I was to come back. So I think the doors stay open if the scripts are good. That's that's what I think at the end of the day. And, and you're right about Daisy. Daisy, for whatever reason, because I think Daisy's a damn good actress, but for whatever reason, people haven't gone to see her films, you know, like Chaos Walking and such. Um, Hannah wants to know, do you know if Nintendo has any plans to adapt Zelda? No. Okay. But that would make a lot of sense. I mean, I think that is probably like the next Nintendo icon that you would turn to, right? Yeah, I would think so too. I think it'd be fun to make a Kirby movie though, like for kids. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah, true. That would be good. Yeah. I mean, we're about to get a night at the museum animated film or series that's for kids. So yeah, it just makes sense to kind of start. I don't know. I always liked Kirby when I was a kid. I like this one. It's not a, a donation, but I don't read this. Roka, Jeff, what have you heard regarding rumors from Grace Randolph that Disney and Marvel Studios are still deciding if Daredevil Born Again should be TVMA or TV14 after Iger replaced Chapik? This is something we brought up last week, Jeff. Will Iger coming in change the ratings of some of these projects that they're working on? What do you think is going to happen here? Do you Have you heard anything about Daredevil Born Again, like the struggle between what they want to rate it as? Uh, no, I, I mean, I haven't heard anything specifically beyond what everyone else has read. Um, okay. I mean, so, so what, what is the idea that Chapek was going to let it be super dark and I yes. let it be super dark. Yeah. And okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I don't really know. Uh, it, it makes sense. 
Right. Like, you know, I know, I don't think Grace is always wrong, right? She's certainly been right about some She's things. been right about some things, yeah. And look, no one's fucking right all the time. No one. No exactly. one. So, so uh, I, I believe it could be a behind-the-scenes debate, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and it could be it's as simple as, like, an email, and then you're just using it for news, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if, I, if I'm Bob Iger and I'm coming back after leaving and... and I don't know if I just start messing with everything creatively, like you know, mm-hmm. maybe reset the the executive roster, which he certainly has. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I don't know if you start messing with stuff like that. Fair enough. Kelchick Perkins, uh, Pickens, sorry, Kelchick Pickens says, with Strange World being a complete box office bomb and the last few Pixar films not lighting up the box office either, do you guys expect any leadership changes at Pixar and Walt Disney Animation? Yeah, I because mean, Lasseter stepped down. And then um, Pete Doctor stepped in with I can't remember the the um, the other woman who was an executive there as well. They kind of co-ran things at Pixar. But uh, what do you think? I mean, Strange World really bombing. Do you think there'll be leadership changes? I does Iger come back, take a look at the animation division, and be like, hey, we got to make some changes here. My answer is no. Okay. Uh, I think that those people don't grow on trees. Fair enough. Uh, the, those those animation experts. It's tough to find people who really know what they're doing, yeah. particularly on a feature level. Um, so, no, and I think like Elemental, I think that yeah. that would be a hit for Pixar. That you looks do. like it okay. would be fun. Yeah, I've liked all the Pixar movies, so I don't know why they haven't hit with people to the level that the previous Pixar movies did. But I've enjoyed them. Luca. I, part of it is that Disney has trained people to wait for streaming for Pixar. Yeah. You know, and it's just like if parents are like, oh, I could see Turning Red. Was that theaters or Disney Plus? I forget. That was Disney Plus. Yeah. yeah. What's the last Pixar that went to theaters or whatever? For Pixar? I don't even Yeah. Yeah, I don't even remember, man, to be honest. Maybe. Oh, Onward. Onward. Probably the last one that went to theaters. No, but didn't like has every Pixar movie gone streaming only since then? Did Luca? Luca was streaming, right? Yes, Luca was, but was there another one that recently? Like, what's well, oh, Lightyear? Lightyear was in theaters. Oh, Lightyear. Okay, so like, I do think that people saw Lightyear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and they said, okay, well, I can see this in the middle of June, or I could just see it in the middle of July for free on Disney Plus, right? Yeah. How long did it take to come to Disney Plus? Not that long, right? No, no, no. it was pretty. It pretty longer pretty. than a month, but it wasn't that long. Yeah. Yeah. And then, but like that's Disney's own fault for for training the audience that way. Yeah, I mean, Soul was straight streaming, Luco straight streaming, and Turning Red, then Lightyear was the first one fully back in theaters. Uh, yeah, so there you go. All right, uh, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, any more stream? No. Okay, no more Streamlab Super Chats just yet, so we'll take a quick break and jump into some more stuff. 45 right. days you waited for Disney. <laughs> Sorry. Jesus Christ. You know, I'm trying to do a job here, man. All right, go ahead. What were you going to say? What were you saying there, Chad, tail end? You're, doing, you're going too quickly. But you know why? Because it's 45 minutes in the show and we've only gotten to four topics, Jeff. And oh my know. god, we have so many more topics to discuss. Let's yeah. let's talk about the topics. Aaron Taylor Johnson. All right. Yeah. Aaron Taylor Johnson, a front I- runner for James Bond, according to some British website that you've never heard of from a writer you don't know. It's the sun. <laughs> everyone's heard of the sun. What's wrong? Yeah, everyone's with heard of the sun and the, and the fact that the sun's full of shit. Okay. Now listen. Bond is the only franchise that I give the British reporters credit for. Okay? Yeah. Because they obviously have their sources and are plugged in there. But like now they're just like throwing fucking names out there. I, d- I do think he would be great. I think he is kind of the appropriate level of famous. Yeah. I always liked him as an actor. I think he's a good looking dude. Yeah. Right. There's something about like no more Bond girls. Yeah. Bond women. Okay. okay? Aaron Taylor Johnson's with a woman. Right. Yes. Um, I, I lo- like they should play off that. I want Bond to have like a much older love interest. Here's what I'll tell you. I don't know if I liked it. If I like this idea, I did like him in Bullet Train though. But I have kind of found him boring at times as an actor. So I don't know if I a hundred percent boring. Did you see Nocturnal Animals? I bet you didn't. Oh, I did see Nocturnal An- Animals. That was a pretty brutal yeah. film. Yeah, he was great in that. He was, yes, as that kind of stuff, sure. But did you see Godzilla? It was like watching Vanilla. I mean, like, it was not that everyone, interesting. In Godzilla. Everyone in all, they have so many great actors in those movies, and they all get completely neutralized 
because no one's there to fucking watch them. And the dialogue is just atrocious. Fine, fine. But I'm just telling you my personal. I'm not holding Godzilla against Aaron Taylor Johnson. I mean, Chloe Grace Moretz was more, the most interesting part of Kick-Ass, dude. That's his franchise, and Chloe Grace was the more interesting actor of the two. Eric, just... that's the great, that's the best role. He's playing the straight man there. He's up with Nicolas Cage and fucking Red Mist, and come on. <laughs> Kick-Ass is one of the greatest comic book movies ever. I know, now, I loved it. Alt, or is it in spite of him? Like, come on. Okay, all right. Well, did, I'll did have you like to see it. it. Did you Look, like I'm it sure there are people just like me that were like, Daniel Craig. I'm sure there are people just like me that felt that way. So, do you see the wall? The wall. Oh yeah, the wall. Yes, the um, CNN one, right? The uh, the guy who produced it was the guy who was a was yeah, that Jake Tapper? He was a producer on it. Yeah, John Cena. Right. Is that yeah. the one? Yeah, I think so. I don't yeah, know. yeah, that was That's good. Crazy. But what of those films make you think he's Bond? What is it in those films that make you think he's... I think he has a certain sex appeal to him. You do? Okay. Yes. Oh, oh, for sure. Okay. It's it's okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, let's get to this prime video stuff, dude. You say I'm going too fast. We got to get to this. What about this prime there's, video stuff? Look, there's a lot of prime video stuff happening. They, they got a Scar Joe project. They got that Channing Tatum pr- thing, Red Shirt. Right, yeah. from right. Uh, Simon Kinberg and, and David Leach is going to be directing it. Yeah, I don't know if that's like another franchise or, or whatever. I think you know, probably it, it will be. It'll probably be like a James Bond style okay. thing. Everything's like James, everybody wants just like James Bond style. Like, there's something special about James Bond. You can't just like make a guy a spy and say, Oh, it's James Bond, right? Um, I, I do like Channing Tatum. Channing Tatum's having a hot year, people okay. like Channing Tatum. Channing Tatum is a movie star. Channing Tatum is a movie star in a way that Chris Evans. You're, you're, ever you're insane. You're absolutely you're insane. insane. You're, you're insane, Tatum. John. Channing Tatum is a movie star? You are fucking nuts, dude. Channing Tatum is a way bigger movie star than Chris oh. Evans could even fucking dream of being. Oh. Look, first of all, Chris Evans can act. Second of all, I don't know what you're... Oh, come on. Channing Tatum is a way better actor than oh, Chris Oh, my Evans. God. What? Is, what are you talking about? I mean... Go watch a guy recognizing your saints. Go what? Me, you ever seen a guy recognizing your saints? Chris Evans has not given a performance as good as Channing Tatum's like first performance. Look, um, he's funny for the things that he does. He's good for the things that he does. I, the Lost City, he's good in that. You tweet this. We are we are going at this right now. <laughs> no, because people are always going to go on your side. For God's sakes, um, are they always going to go? On, you know, I think that Chris Evans might be bigger than Channing Tatum online, but there, you know, I mean, people are wrong. Yeah, uh, yeah. Look, it, it, he takes me out of the hateful eight. He is so miscast as that role in the hateful eight. His magic Mike movie. You tell me he was good in Jupiter Ascending. Is that what you're trying to tell me? That he was a good actor in Jupiter Ascending? Dude, Chris Evans could never ever do something like the Magic Mike movies. He could never ever do something like because well, that's not his sensibility. He's not a trained dancer like Channing Tatum one. It was. He's not a stripper like Channing Tatum was. That's a different thing. That's- Evans, you put Chris Evans with a dog together. There's no way that that movie performs like dog did. I disagree a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I disagree with you. You put Chris Evans with a dog. That is, um, <laughs> I'm not going to say what that is. I don't want to get myself in trouble. <laughs> Let's just say there's going to be a lot of people who are going to go see that and lose their shit. Girl, girls night out. Movie. Yeah. Basically girls night out. Absolutely. Yeah, Come on, you, you, are- you you like defending Jacob. He's fucking great in defending Jacob. He was great in defending Jacob. He was great. He's funny. He's great in Knives Out. It, 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 completely sending himself up. He's funny in Scott Pilgrim. I mean, what about Gifted? What about the film uh, with that, with him and Jenny Slate and the child? See, didn't see. Oh, okay. So here's your ass, and you're talking out of it. Snowpiercer. What about Snowpiercer? He's fucking great in Snowpiercer. Listen. I'm not saying that Chris Evans is dog shit. That's not what I'm saying. It here. sounds like that's what you're I'm saying. saying. That Channing Tatum is way bigger than he'll ever be. Oh my god, you're insane! Just, just the level of insane. Because first of all, he's Captain America, so and that's, he's all already that's way bigger than somebody starring in Magic Mike. 
Th- like, does does that make Anthony Mackie bigger than Brad Pitt because he's Captain America now? Like, that's what? A diff- that's a different situation. He's Falcon first, then they gave him the he's shield. That's a different Captain situation. No, no, that's like trying to tell me. Well, then Don Cheadle should be as big as Robert Downey Jr. No, that's not. It's not if how it works. Danny Tatum was in What's Your Number with Anna Faris. That movie would have grossed twice as much money. You're insane. That was not. I saw that movie in the theater. It was that was that was an Anna Faris vehicle. Channing Tatum had voiced Buzz Lightyear. It adds twenty million dollars to the gross. Uh, I tell you this: Chris Evans would have got a Gambit movie made. I'll tell you that right now if he'd been cast as Gambit. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. How you like them apples? <laughs> You're insane, Chris Evans. People are like, oh, he couldn't help open Buzz Lightyear. That's such a. You can't even remotely compare that in the situation because people were mad that it wasn't Tim Allen. It wasn't like he was starting from scratch with a character that he built and boom, he was not. If people wanted Tim Allen. Lost City would have been as big with Chris Evans and Sandra Bullock. You're nuts. Yeah, but he's not going to play that kind of character. That's not Chris Evans' wheelhouse to play the dumb meathead. That's not the dumb, lovable meathead. That is not Chris Evans' instinct. He's much more of an, he radiates an intelligent energy so it's just different not that channing isn't i'm sure channing is a smart guy made his money do his thing i got no qualm make your money but son make your money but um to me chris evans is a different different energy so you're not going to get the same kind of movies from channing that you would from chris put channing and gifted you tell me how that's going to turn out better oh. than it did for chris evans which yeah. no one yeah. you guys are crazy you're fucking crazy uh I love I love this idea. What was it? Uh, yeah, Foxcatcher. He was good in Foxcatcher. Yeah, I liked Channing in Foxcatcher. Absolutely, not going to deny that. You just dismissed Channing Tatum as a dumb meathead. I, I would. That's the, I'm saying that's the what he played in that role. Dumb, lovable meathead is what he was in Lost City. I'm not saying that he is that. I'm saying that's what he plays. He can play that with his eyes closed. You know. All right. <sighs> but, uh, okay, so <laughs> way, we, like Channing Tatum. we got off track here. Yeah, duh. Now that Channing Tatum's gonna kick my ass the next time he sees me, go on. this Channing Tatum movie, and they're like paying him. What are they paying him? Twenty five million or something like that. Kinberg's getting, Kinberg's getting like eight million, and like David Leach is getting like what is it? I don't have the story in front of him. Fifteen million, eighteen million, something ridiculous. Why is this happening? What's this for? This is gray man money. Speaking of Chris Evans, like yeah, do like do streamers feel like they have to to do this? Um, what was hilarious to me was just like the Ankler did a, an amazing thing with all of Kinberg's spec sales, right? Yeah, and, like, yeah. Fleming writing about them and everything. None of these movies have been made. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Remember Pyros with Reese Witherspoon? That was a big thing. Here comes the flood. Uh, Jason Bateman was going to direct it for Netflix. All these Kinberg specs. That like make a lot of noise and then they go nowhere. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I, I I find Kinberg to be overrated for the most part. A hundred percent. After that, after that X Men debacle, I don't know why you would throw millions of dollars at this guy. I, I don't get it. Like I don't get it. And to me, you know, uh, red shirt. It sounds like red corner and red uh, red. I yes, and red red one, yeah. which is Dwayne Johnson's other Amazon movie. Yeah, I red. Chris Evans is about to star in a film with, with uh, Dwayne Johnson, a Christmas movie. If that blows up, who are you going to give credit to? Chris or The Rock? The Rock. Oh, geez. The Rock. The guy, yeah. who, the guy who tried to tell me that the uh, box office for Black Adam is A24 numbers, that they're, they're the A24 of the DC universe. That's the guy you're going to give? Come on. I'm high on The Rock after seeing DC League of Super Bets. Oh, right. He was great in DC League of Super. Look, I love The Rock, but, you know, let's deal with reality here. Um, uh, Yeah, so, I mean, that's a lot of money, but, I mean, that's what's going on with Prime Video. Right? They, the, C, was it, the CEO came out and was having this uh, conversation, Jeff? What was the um, – he was doing – was it a sales call? or was What was he doing, the guy? I don't know. The guy doing the thing, talking to the people about the thing. Uh, <laughs> Mark Burnett also left uh, Amazon. Right? Yeah. You know, left MGM, whatever the hell it was. Yeah. Um, so he's gone. There's just been a lot of like shuffling this week with Amazon. Did you read Kim Masters' Hollywood Reporter article on this whole thing with Burnett? I had no idea that for the eight years he was in this deal, he didn't have one hit. Not one hit that was originally 
created while during his eight-year tenure there at MGM and apparently caused a lot of problems. He was, he was described as Trumpian in how he approached managing people, forced other people out, other people quit who were at high-level positions because they didn't want to deal with him anymore. Um, and that's not surprising. I, I, I did a show with him early 2000s, a reality show, and you can tell that it bled from the top some of the attitude and the behaviors and what have you. And of course, his wife is Roma who did the, who, you know, obsessed with the Jesus and the Bible stuff and all of that, you know, and I say that as a Christian myself, but like there's this pushing, nar- pushing this narrative and this idea of how it should, how entertainment should be the right wing type of thing. And I think Burnett has an element of that, or if not, I mean, like a lot of people credit him for creating Trump after celebrity apprentice and what have you. So it's no surprise that he would kind of create this mystique about himself, but there's no there there. So where does he go now? If he hasn't had a hit in eight years of anything original, where does he go? Yeah. I don't really know what happens uh, next with Mark Burnett. I mean, I think he'll be just fine as an independent producer or whatever. Yeah. Um, but you know, a lot of changes coming to to Amazon, to MGM. Um, you also saw today that they signed a deal with, uh, Mike Flanagan. Yes, the horse. Right, taking, yeah, taking these talents from Netflix to Amazon, which is kind of a big deal. And like, like I, you know, tweeted earlier when I wrote the piece for the Ankler about the Amazon state of slate, the number one thing that I saw missing, especially considering this year, you know, everything was a huge success, is horror. Yeah, right. Right, like something yeah. like you know they tried. I know you did last summer, and that didn't really work. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they did like a Candyman TV show or something like that, yeah. but they need to exploit MGM's library and make more horror. And so now they have Mike Flanagan um, and maybe Mike Flanagan will just continue to turn out the originals, you know, which yeah. he did for Netflix and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, I, uh, I think that's a good get for them. Well, it was Andy Jassy and he was talking at the New York times deal book summit uh, this past Wednesday. And he's talking about uh, prime video. And he said, I do think over time we have opportunities to make our prime video business a standalone business with very attractive economics. What does that mean, a standalone business, Jeff? Does he mean that he wants to turn them into a film studio or a production studio other than what we've already seen there, like from the original content they've done already? Do you think he's saying like it would stand on its own in a way and be considered one of the big studios to go do projects for? What, Amazon? Yeah. I mean, it is. No, but it, you know, okay. what? it can't be he's saying is that he sees it. it off? Say it again. Say it again. Is he talking about spinning it off? That's what I'm asking you. Cause he says, I do think we have opportunities to make prime video business, a standalone business with very attractive economics. Customers would like to go to a place and find everything they want. They don't want to go to five or six different places. Okay, I, don't, I don't know. I'm not going to fucking try to interpret executive speak because who knows what, okay. you know, what the hell these guys are saying half the time and whether okay. they even mean it the other half of the time, you know? Yeah. Um, I just don't buy any of it. So, well, let me ask you something. You know, you know, you went off on Kyrie. You had issues with the stuff that he was saying. Well, in this story, Jassy uh, said that he was not going to take that book off that, uh, Kyrie recommended on his Twitter that got him all in all kinds of trouble. He said, I am worried about anti-Semitism and I find it very objectionable, but it's a slippery slope when you have content whose primary purpose is not to espouse hate or ascribe negative characteristics to people. You have to be willing to allow viewpoints that are different from your own. There are a lot of books, a lot of pieces of content out there that we don't want to store where every page has a disclaimer. So hundred percent, hundred percent behind him. He's a Jewish guy. Uh, I'm a, the number one thing and you can't have, you, you have to choose. Yeah. Okay. You can't, sometimes you have to make a fucking choice. People, yeah. you can't just have all your morals and ethics on equal footing. Right. Thanks okay? so the I think that the most important is freedom of speech. Yeah. Okay. So okay. I don't care. Like, again, as, as someone who believes in free speech, that means that a Nazi can yell horrible anti-Semitic things in my face mm-hmm. and I will defend their right to say those things. Okay. Okay. So I, I agree with him where it's like, it's a slippery slope. Who the fuck is Amazon to decide what books get read uh, and, and, and published and distributed and, and stuff like that, unless it's like real blatant or inciting violence. Yeah. Um, you know, like clearly like someone like admits to a crime and says, well, this book made me do it. Yeah, it's just not. It's people should be able to decide what they want to read. 
Well, this also sounds like Jordan, though, right? Uh, Republicans buy shoes, too. It just sounds like that as a business. It it's doesn't true. behoove you. Michael Jordan they, wrong? In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. It depends on how you view it. Um, Are we going to view half the country as like, I, I just don't understand that. It's yeah, like, I know. You're right. You're, and as a business, you can't do that, especially as Amazon. There's no way Bezos would stand for that uh, with Amazon if they were to alienate half the it country. It was a little That's surprising, funny. but it was nice to see a company not give in to the woke mob or whatever. Oh my God, please. This is the woke mob being. What? Oh what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? There, need, there needs to be a line drawn. You don't just get everything you want. Well, you let, me see if I, let me see if I've got this right. You think Amazon cannot uh, put disclaimers on every one of these books and decide for themselves what is possibly inflammatory and what isn't. But you think there must be some imaginary line drawn somewhere that everyone is going to 100% agree on that that's the line you can't go past. No, they're the I'm same thing, and neither one of those no things line. exist. I'm saying there is no line. That's what I'm saying. But you're saying there needs to be a line drawn. What's the difference? Drawing a line is the same thing as putting a disclaimer on something and claiming that it's got issues and is anti-Semitic. It's, it's the same thing. I'm saying, like, Kyrie sounded like a fucking moron saying all that stuff, but you know, I don't think he should not be allowed to play basketball or not be allowed to be in the NBA. And oh, I no disagree, with, I disagree with that 100%. You think that he should be a like being? I think he should have been suspended. And the and when he, he didn't take, right, but I'm saying when he not initially, when he didn't take it back. Initially, the NBA moved in and did all. I think did all the right moves overall to bring this situation to bear. But there's no way you change the guy's point of view when you, you threaten his money. In one of the world's best basketball players shouldn't be allowed to play basketball because he has a controversial viewpoint controversial what are you talking about if it's okay to explore it but look i didn't say he should be i'm saying if he had not apologized authentically if he had not actually gone through these things then i think yes the nba had every right to suspend him you know why because they're a fucking brand and the last thing they're going to do is get behind somebody who's anti-semitic just because he can dribble a fucking ball they're not going to do that there's a brand itself it's not a good look for your brand you know and look, are, you, are you saying that this isn't a good look for Amazon by not banning this book? No, no, I, I don't. I just find it curious because um, uh, to me, I don't I think he's right to say, like, well, we can't put a disclaimer because you're right, because then you becomes the thought police and you wonder who's do it's almost a version of book banning or book burning, to be honest with you. And so you start to wonder where the limits are. By the same token, I also don't want the right wing trying to throw books out of libraries trying to burn them, trying to claim they're grooming shit. I don't want any of that. on. So as long as both sides can agree to stop censoring, then I'm 100% behind it, you know? So yeah, I don't know where you're bringing up this other point or whatever, but yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I, I think everything should be published and people, it should be up to people to decide. Right. <sighs> you got my heart rate saying, what's wrong with you? Trying to get my, trying to make me a cocaine bear right now. For I got I to gotta wrap this up. I can't go long today. See, see, you son of a bitch. You say I'm going too fast. And then you say, we got to wrap shit up. When we haven't gotten to half the fucking topic. I this three. Why I go fast. What is the important stuff that you want to talk about? Warner's Zoe making Saldana a deal with burnt out on franchise films. Zoe Saldana, stop doing franchise films if you're burnt out on them. Well, she's not. She's doing five or six. Of James Gunn talking about his DC plans. Did he say anything interesting? Did he say anything interesting, John? What did not he say? that you would know about because you what don't read say? comics. What did James Gunn say? What about De Niro leading a Netflix TV series? Anything to think about that? I mean, I, I'm fucking in. I'm, 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 it's about time. To, you know, Pacino's been doing TV shows left and right. That's true. Where you been, Bobby? How's he coming back for Hunter season two? How are they doing that? Flashback. I mean, flashbacks, right? Things you like think? that. Uh, I'm his twin brother. Uh, um, yeah, I don't think so. What about Warner's making a deal with Amazon Prime for DC Animation to live on Prime Video? Great. I, I don't watch DC animated stuff. I can't, you know, like what's, what are we talking about here? The, 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 the fucking Harley Quinn show? Like what? Or is yeah. It, and it's not even that like, would it all be there? Or wouldn't it just be like what DC, what HBO Max doesn't want? Like they would still get first dibs. Well, this is what I think. I, but I think this is the move there. I think they're going to eventually destroy HBO Max. I think they've got a long-term plan here where they're going to start it's already now the fucking home shopping network in essence a combined with drama I, mean, I don't know where like you know i check my screeners app all the time do yeah. they make even do they even make shows anymore yeah i don't know that they do right exactly 
So that's the frustrating part of this all. They keep cutting and cutting. How and cutting. are they going to get rid of it? They need some streaming component. They, I know that, you know, David Zaslav's talked about being a seller more and like, you know, we don't mm -hmm. all have to just give it to us. You know, if it makes sense to sell it, we're going to sell it. Yeah, yeah. But like, why would they sell all the like big DC animated things? Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, Spencer Milne wants to know thoughts on After Sun. Have you seen this? After yeah. Sun? I don't know what After Sun is. It was uh, good. I didn't love it? it at first, um, but it grew on me by the end. It, like I cried uh, in the last scene, and it was because it was wow. like cathartic. What is it? It was no Violent Night, though, John. I mean, I don't know if I cried as much as a Violent Night. Don't blame me for that shit. After Sun, it's a movie with Paul Mescal. Um, okay. Mescal, I don't know how we pronounce his name, but uh, okay. It's just about like a father and daughter and like this girl, like, you know, making videos of their trip together. Oh, yeah. okay. Is it on Prime? Very, very good. Okay. Also, he wants to love the show, guys. IndieWire released their top 25 today alongside Sight and Sound. And I'd like to thank IndieWire for getting it right. After Sun is the best movie of the year. Took my breath away. There you go. Get, Definitely get not the best movie of the year. Definitely not. I mean, it's a uh, tone poem. Is Parasite in the top 100 films ever made? Is that what you're saying? So absurd, that sight and sound poll. I'm glad that we're pretty... Okay, we're going to wrap it up on, on this. Is there something else? We're going to wrap up in sight and sound. So is there something else you want to talk about? No, no. Let's go yeah, on. Go ahead. Sound. Sight and sound. What a ridiculous poll. I mean, wake me when all the critics voting for this are dead and it becomes people like John and I putting heat at number one. You know, <laughs> just like, who are these people who vote on these things? Who are the people who even watch half these fucking movies? I understand that I haven't seen them, so I don't really get to say whether they're great or not. I'm sure that they are great. They sound fucking boring as hell. And if you're telling me the portrait of a lady on fire is better than fucking Godfather 2 in Chinatown, how am I even supposed to take the rest of your fucking list seriously? <laughs> yeah, what's the number one film? Who gives a fuck? None of us are going to watch this movie. You put Vertigo over Citizen Kane? Come on. I hate when people do that. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's not even a matter of this over this over this. If it's on the list, it's on the list. Yeah. But like Moonlight and Parasite, that, that is like such like a basic, like I'm a pretentious film Twitter dweeb douchebag take. Like like give me a fucking break manchester by the sea blows both of those movies out of the fucking water any day of the week i don't care what you tell me oh i love manchester by the sea uh, yeah i don't disagree with you there but yeah. the someone's gonna tell me parasites better than manchester by the sea no no i can't i can't make that that's comment. false i will that's not choose false. a side in this debate on that tell one. me moonlight's better than drive no <laughs> that i i can't i have to push back on you on that one a little bit so that was meant to rile you up. Okay. Because <laughs> I was like, what are you fucking you talking about? You're fucking Moonlight? It's better than fucking Drive Bun? <laughs> Barry Lyndon's on this list? Fuck Barry Lyndon, man. There's no bo more bullshit. boring Kubrick Lights film. Sound is bullshit. Critics are bullshit. Ugh. Not enough Westerns on this list. Um, all right, well, there you go. Those are thoughts. There's our thoughts. Thanks, everybody, for the stream live super chats. We appreciate it, man. Thanks for hanging out. We had 260 of you watching us tonight. Today, I really appreciate it. Make sure you hit a like on this video uh, and leave a comment down below. Also, some of you can hit that thanks button if you didn't get a chance to send a stream lab or super chat. If you're watching it later, you can send some money in that way as well. Give us some love. Um, Jeff, where can they find you? Anything going on? Theankler.com, btlnews.com, lamag.com, and our sponsor, Above the Line, Above the Line.com. We're going to have a newsletter soon, folks. We're working on getting you a wow. newsletter. Wow, wow. We've got some exciting things in the hopper. Stay That's tuned. Good. That's good. That's good. Uh, as for me, he goes, follow me at The Roca Says on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, The Outlaw Nation on Twitch. I am parched, so excuse me for the smacking of the lips. Uh, we just did a bunch of trailer reactions today for the Geek Buddies. We did. And, and, uh, did the Guardians of the Galaxy, did uh, Indiana Jones, and did um, uh, Transformers. So go and watch those, plus our live show earlier today. So we had a lot of fun today on the Geek Buddies. Hopefully you're watching all of that stuff along with hanging out with us here on the Hot Mic. We appreciate it badly. Big thanks, as Jeff said, to Above the Line for powering and sponsoring this show. Um, take care of yourselves. Be well. Have a great weekend. And uh, we'll talk to you next time with another brand new episode of the Hot Mic. <laughs> Thank you.